Good evening from Linz and a very warm welcome to the AI and ecology panel on this first day of a very special Art Electronica Festival. It's the year 2020 and if the worldwide coronavirus pandemic, pandemic that we are um, still going through teaches, teaches us one thing, it's that we can change our behaviors and we can make use of our technological tools to avoid an even bigger crisis if we want to. Um, there are still some deniers and skeptics around, some of them unfortunately in very powerful positions in this world, but aside from COVID-19, we have another global crisis to fight. Um, it's one that researchers have been warning us about for decades. It's one that makes young people around the world beg for attention on Fridays. It's one that we have somewhat lost out of sight recently due to the pandemic. It's the climate crisis that goes along with global warming, with um, species extinction, with um, water pollution, and with societal and social effects whose dimensions are not yet known to all of us. Um, what we know is that the climate is already warming and what we know is that this is due to human activity on this planet. So the question for tonight's panel is how can we make use of our technological tools and especially the tool that everyone is talking about at the moment, namely artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks to reduce CO2 emissions, to avoid further warming of the planet, to protect the species that live with us in this world. This is what we're gonna hear about um, in this panel, in a keynote speech. This is what we'll discuss with top class experts from various disciplines um, in the upcoming one and a half hours. My name is Martina Mara. I'm a professor of robopsychology at the Linz Institute of Technology here at Johannes Kepler University, um, which is this year's venue of the Ars Electronica Festival. I'm also a member of the Austrian Council on Robotics and Artificial Intelligence, which is co-hosting this panel together with Ars Electronica. The Austrian Council on Robotics and AI is an advisory board of the, of the Austrian Ministry, I have to read this, the Austrian Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. Uh, it's not for nothing that this ministry is called the Mega Ministry of Austria. Our recommendations are available to all Austrians and for the coming year, we as a council have set ourselves the goal of increasingly addressing the interfaces between AI and climate protection. And this panel is also a wonderful start for us. I'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker for this panel. Um, who will give us an introduction to computational sustainability in the next 15 minutes. It's a new interdisciplinary field which she significantly helped to establish. Carla Gomes is a professor of computing and information science and she's the director of the Institute for Computational Sustainability at Cornell University. She's a pioneer in developing AI methods to address challenges in ecological sustainability. And I very much look forward to hearing more about her approach and examples from her work. So Carla, it's your turn. Hello, I'm Carla Gomes from Cornell University. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this fantastic festival and this panel on AI for Ecology. Thank you, Bernard, for the invitation. I'll be talking about computational sustainability, computing for a better world and a sustainable future. So what is computational sustainability? Computational sustainability is an interdisciplinary field that aims to develop computational methods for sustainable development. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising future generations. 
This notion was introduced by the United Nations in 1987 in a seminal report called Our Common Future, or the Brentland Report, led by Gro Brentland, then the Prime Minister of Norway. Our Common Future also stressed that sustainability is not only about the environment, it encompasses balancing environmental, economic and societal needs. In fact, the ultimate goal of sustainable development is human well-being of current and future generations. More recently, in 2015, the United Nations put forward a very ambitious research agenda of 17 sustainable development goals, ranging from no poverty, no hunger, health, education, water, electricity and economic growth for all, as well as a set of goals concerning the protection of our planet, namely climate action and the protection of all types of life on Earth. So, computational sustainability is truly an interdisciplinary endeavor and it involves very challenging research questions. At Cornell, we have a variety of projects concerning three main sustainability themes, conservation and biodiversity, balancing environmental and socioeconomic needs, and accelerating discovery of materials for renewable energy. In this short presentation, I'll talk about bird conservation and planning of hydropower dam placement in the Amazon basin. Our main computational themes are optimization, dynamical models and simulation, machine learning, and multi-agent systems and citizen science. I should stress that our sustainability projects lead to truly transformative synthesis across sustainability domains and also computer science and AI sub-areas. This slide shows cross-cutting computational themes captured by subway lines. The different projects correspond to stations and the lines correspond to computational themes. I'll talk about the black line, large-scale spatial and temporal prediction, and the brown line concerning optimization for bird conservation and hydropower dam planning in the Amazon basin. A fundamental question in biodiversity research concerns understanding how different species are distributed across landscapes over time. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a very exciting citizen science program called eBird. eBird has over 450,000 volunteer birders who have submitted over 650 million bird observations corresponding to more than 22 million hours of field work. This is a lot of work more than three times the time it took to build the Empire State Building. These bird observations are very precious and because we have a large volume, we actually can get a good signal. And we combine the bird observations with environmental data and using adaptive spatial and temporal machine learning models we can relate the environmental predictors to observe patterns of occurrence and absence of the species. This animation actually shows the out output of a machine learning model. It shows the pattern of migration of the northern pintail. These models reveal the habitat preference of the birds at a very fine resolution, and in fact, they constitute the basis of the State of the Bird report released officially by the Secretary of Interior. They also allow for fundamental new ways of doing conservation. As an example, Bird Returns is a program of the Nature Conservancy for protecting migratory water birds in California against drought. What you see here is the Pacific Migration Flyway. E-bird models predict the bird's migration paths and identify the target areas that need to be conserved. The Nature Conservancy program allows farmers to submit bids 
to keep the target rice fields flooded during the short periods of migration in California. They use combinatorial reverse auctions. The Nature Conservancy has generated over 20,000 acres of additional habitat for water birds in California. I should point out that this is a radically novel, dynamic way of doing bird conservation, and it's only possible because of the use of advanced computational methods. In the last 50 years, there has been a proliferation of hydropower dams in the Amazon basin, the real Amazon. In fact, already around 200 dams have been built or are under construction, and more than 300 dams are planned or proposed. The main reason for constructing a hydropower dam is obviously the production of energy. However, when evaluating alternative placement of dams, we have also to consider the different ecosystem service that river networks provide. In fact, dams fragment rivers and therefore they affect negatively a variety of ecosystem service provided by rivers, such as fish production, transportation and navigation, and sediment production. Dams can even lead to the production of greenhouse gases due to the fact that they can flood large areas of land, which can lead to the decomposition of organic matter with the release of methane. So, from a computational perspective, this is a multi-objective optimization problem, and we are interested in computing the Pareto frontier. What is the Pareto frontier? The Pareto frontier captures the trade-offs with respect to the different objectives of the different solutions of dam portfolios. Here is a simple example of a Pareto frontier. In this plot, the x-axis represents energy and the y-axis represents ecological value. If we don't build any dams, we keep all the ecological value. On the other hand, if we build lots of dams, we destroy all the ecological value. This solution is in between. And in fact, this solution has the same energy output, but a much higher ecological value than this other solution. So this solution is dominated by the one on the Pareto frontier. On the left hand side, we see two dam configurations with similar hydropower yields, but different degrees of river connectivity. The right configuration is better from the point of view of river connectivity since it builds the dams away from the mouth of the river. So the river is not as fragmented as the configuration on the left hand side. In our work, we are developing algorithms for computing the Pareto frontier, both the exact Pareto frontier, but also efficient approximations, and in particular, we are developing fully polynomial time. Hello, I'm very fast algorithm for eliminating dominated solutions that runs in order n log n. To give you an example, we can compute the approximate the Pareto frontier with 99.9% uh, guarantee for three criteria in a question of minutes. We are also exploiting hybrid strategies because this problem is truly exponentially in the number of criteria. Therefore, it is important to find fast uh, solutions of uh, computing the, the Pareto frontier. In this slide, we illustrate the cost of inefficient planning. This curve represents the Pareto frontier, considering all the dams, 
as if we had planned them before building a single one. This is the point we are at, given the, dim the dams that have been already built. We can see the foregone environmental benefits. For this amount of energy, we could have had a much higher ecological value in terms of river connectivity. Alternatively, for this river connectivity, we could produce much more energy. This is the Pareto frontier going for, forward. Let me highlight that we are considering many other criteria, energy, sediment, seismic risk, biodiversity, in particular fish, greenhouse gases, uh, indigenous populations affected, etc. Also, we have a very large team of collaborators, including biologists, ecologists, hydrologists, and social scientists. Here we show the Pareto frontier with respect to energy and greenhouse gases. Not because we want to minimize greenhouse gas emissions on the left axis, the Pareto frontier has a different shape, the lower the better. This work appeared recently in Nature Communications. The lead author is our postdoc, Rafael Dalmeida. You see his picture here. We consider two different time horizons. On the left, a 20-year time horizon, and on the right, a 100-year time horizon. A key point with this work is that if we don't plan the dams properly, we can actually end up with solutions that are dirtier than coal. You see these purple uh, lines. And this happens because, as I mentioned before, dams can lead to the generation of greenhouse gases since they can flood very large areas that lead to the decomposition of organic matter resulting in the release of methane. As a summary, this slide shows the Pareto frontier with respect to different criteria. On the left, top left, we see river connectivity. On the right, sediment production, fish biodiversity, and at the bottom, greenhouse gas emissions and degree of regulation of the river. We see that we lost the most ecological value in terms of river connectivity and biodiversity, fish biodiversity. In other words, the gap between the ideal Pareto frontier and the current Pareto frontier is the largest for connectivity and fish biodiversity. In summary, computational sustainability aims to advance computational methods to help balance environmental, economic, and societal needs for sustainable development. Computational sustainability is a two-way street. On one hand, we can inject computational thinking, providing new insights, methodologies, and solutions to sustainability problems. On the other hand, sustainability questions lead to foundational contributions to computer science by exposing computer science to new challenging problems and new formalisms and concepts from other disciplines and leading to new cross-cutting problems in computer science. More importantly, computational sustainability can have tremendous societal impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla, for this great keynote and this practical examples from your work. Um, I have um, maybe two short follow-up questions for you. Uh, the first is, um, you say that your work um, helps to balance um, environmental and economic goals, for example, also societal ones. Um, the coronavirus crisis um, is considered also a you know, global economic crisis right now. So 
how what could you contribute to um, yeah to reduce um, the e economic disadvantages right now, or how to balance um, climate protection, sustainable development goals, and economy? Ah, you are still muted. Muted. You know, that is a very good question. Uh, I, I think in general, and uh, 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 a key aspect is the, uh, the fact that, you know, when we are trying to design systems, we need to really consider different uh, implications. And indeed, the coronavirus is now a very specific situation. And I would say, you know, in general, the, the uh, amazing thing about computer science is, you know, we, we have a set, and AI, we have a set of approaches and tools that can be applied to a variety of concepts, a variety of con contexts, you know. We can study, you know, how the virus spread the same way I studied, for example, in my own work. I'm doing a lot of work on understanding how invasive species spread and how to stop them. Uh, uh, so, so what I've tried to emphasize exactly in this talk, and thank you for the, you know, the question, is that we cannot just design systems with a little particular goal in mind. We need to try to understand the, the consequences of our actions and therefore, in fact, what I would say, to, we should aim uh, and try to develop more ethical AI systems that, you know, consider a variety of goals and objectives. I use the, 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 our project that we actually have. This is a real project in the real Amazon basin. Uh, this project, you know, typically uh, people build hydropower dams thinking, oh, this is clean energy and it's going to be great. Well, our uh, uh, position, and as you, uh, Martina, you saw, we have a very large team, and in fact, I should even honor a colleague and who was in, uh, been involved in this project and unfortunately passed away in, you know, collecting data for fish. You know, this is really, you know, we need to have a variety of people, and uh, there are many, many. Uh, possible consequences of our actions. So our work has been trying to consider all the different aspects uh, 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 in terms of, for example, for, for the placement of the dams, you know, how it's going to affect uh, 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 fisheries, how it's going to affect the populations, for example, indigenous population, how it's going to uh, affect the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the generation of sediment. So, so back, you know, the same way we can look at this problem from a uh, multi-criteria, Again, we can consider other problems and including, you know, there we have the tools to, to, to study problems such as, you know, the spreading of coronavirus, etc. So I'm not sure if I answer your question. Uh, the coronavirus is not a species um, particularly worth um, protecting, but there are many, many other species um, in the world that we actually want to protect. And you, um, you are applying AI methods for, for the study of um, mobility patterns of specific bird populations uh, that can be used to better protect these animals. Um, but as I said, I mean, there are so many um, other species in the world. So um, is it possible to, or is it easy to, you know, scale up um, based uh, on your efforts and models to, to other species? Yeah, that's a very good question. And in fact, when we talk about birds, we are actually talking about, you know, hundreds of species of birds. And, and you know, 
one issue that I would like to emphasize is the AI technology really allows us to scale up solutions. That is actually what is so exciting, you know. And, you know, traditional uh, uh, approaches, you know, uh, uh, I, they basically often actually focus on uh, studying one species at a time. Even, you know, ecologists are fully aware that, uh, you know, it is important to understand the way species interact, interact with the environment, but also how species interact with each other. Yet, you know, the models are typically uh, 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 studying one species at a time without understanding the interactions of species. Our work has actually pushed the frontier of models to actually understand and uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, capture the species interactions. Uh, we have studied indeed uh, uh, a lot of our work has emphasized uh, uh, and uh, uh, had been about uh, bird conservation. Uh, in part because, you know, at Cornell we have the Lab of Ornithology, which is, you know, uh, uh, an amazing uh, uh, bird uh, conservation uh, research and uh, and actually with real connections to NGOs, etc. But we are, have also, you know, developed models for uh, Bears. In fact, we have a, a, an effort with uh, Ecuador, the you know, uh, to protect the Andean bear, also uh, ov wolverines and other species, and so so these models are very ge general. I mean, on one hand, you know, there's the component of trying to. Uh, predict and understand the patterns how uh, uh, the species are distributed. Another component is how am I going to protect? How should I set up reserves to to protect the the species? In my talk, I showed, for example, how can I create habitat for birds when they are flying uh, the water birds uh, through uh, uh, California? So. So, you know, these are very general settings and, and indeed the approaches are very general. I have to say, the AI is even more general and I, I think that is quite exciting. You know, the models we use to study uh, species distributions, we are using those models to study uh, uh, materials, uh, the distribution of uh, elements in materials or to study, uh, you know, uh, uh, for computer vision to try to predict, you know, uh, the, the different uh, 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 components we see in an image. So, our models are super general and can be applied to, to study birds, but can be applied to many other many other entities uh, uh, beyond birds or species. That sounds really promising. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, I'd now start to introduce um, the other panelists that are with us um, tonight. At least in Linz, it's already evening. Um, they have been listening for a while um, and certainly also have a lot to say on our panel subject. So I'll introduce each of you um, with a short opening questions and opening question and I would like to ask you to use it to give us a little insight into your work, um, what you're currently up to and the points that are especially important from your point of view. and. I'd like to start with um, Lynn Kark. Um, she is a postdoctoral researcher at the Energy Politics Group of ETH Zurich, where she's looking at how truck traffic can be monitored using deep learning object detection in satellite images, among many other things, I guess. Um, she co-authored the much noticed paper tackling climate change with machine learning last year. Um, it's a very good source and um, you guys in the audience, if you haven't um, read through it, you should do that. And she's also the co-chair of um, the initiative climate change AI. Um, Lynn, it's great um, 
um, that you are with us. Um, could you tell us a little more about um, climate change AI? Uh, what are the goals of these initiatives and what you're up to right now? Hi, thanks for the introduction. And um, I don't know if I would recommend everybody to read the paper from beginning to start. <laughs> it's very long, it's actually 60 pages. So we see it more as a collection of, um, of application areas that can be relevant for machine learning and, and climate change. And, and that's really how a group of us got started to work on a project. We came from different directions. So there were lots of machine learning researchers that got interested in climate change. I am personally, um, I was doing my PhD on energy and climate change policy, and I was also working on machine learning. Um, so I was trying to combine these things more from the, from the climate change side. And um, we wrote this paper, we ran a workshop at a large machine learning conference, and then we realized that um, for doing impactful work, you really need to know machine learning really well, and you need to know climate change problems that you are addressing really well. So, so what's crucial is to bring together people um, who come from the machine learning community um, with people who have been working on those climate change problems um, in their career. And, and we made this um, sort of a mission, and we funded an organization called Climate Change AI. Um, which is an um, organization that cons consists of volunteers. So we're mostly researchers um, from academia and from industry. Um, and, and what we really um, try to do is facilitate impactful work at the intersection of those fields. And um, we do that by providing venues for people to present their work, to discuss problems. Um, this is both like physical or right now virtual um, events like workshops and um, and other types of um, meetups. And then we um, also have a online forum um, for people to connect and discuss. And um, we also have a monthly newsletter where we um, curate information on, on the intersection of these topics. And um, those um, also we want to extend the, the sets of resources that we provide for people working at that intersection. Um, so you can find everything on our website if you're interested. Yeah, yeah and I think you told me that you've already like 4,000 people um, on your newsletter, right? Yeah, the community is quite large and um, we've actually run a number of events in the past year. So we ran um, workshops at three large machine learning conferences four large machine learning conferences, actually. Um, we also had a panel discussion at the climate change conference, the COP25. Um, so uh, there is a lot of interest in the topic and, and we try to, to channel that interest and to help people connect. Um, one last thing, could you um, explain a bit more about your um, track traffic monitoring, how, how you do that? You know, I'm. I am a psychologist. Uh, I'm kind of a lay person in, in this area. And um, yeah, how it helps protecting um, the environment. Yeah, so that's actually a project that, was, uh, that I still did in my PhD. Um, and um, before I worked on, on freight traffic and I, I looked at the model share, like is, is, is freight transported on the road or on rail, on water? And I realized that um, for the road, transportation, there's a fairly little data, especially in developing countries. So I was wondering if you, if you see trucks and satellite images, can you use that to monitor the truck traffic? So I did um, a little proof of concept. Um, how can we use machine learning to count these trucks automatically on satellite images and then understand better the traffic flow on um, roads? Um, so right now I'm doing also similar kind of research. So Essentially what I'm doing is um, trying to understand how we can use data sources that are not so easy to analyze with um, more classical methods or, or typical methods for policy analysis um, because they appear in a form that's, that's not accessible to these methods. So text data or um, image data or large data sets in, in general. And I'm really interested in how we can um, use machine learning to exploit these new data sets to create um, decision relevant information. Um, so that's really one way that machine learning can be helpful for, for policy analysis. And um, I'm working in the field of, of climate change 
and energy. So um, I'm really like targeting those areas. Probably there are way too many tracks on our roads, right? <laughs> yeah, that for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I'm also very pleased that Claire Monteleone is uh, with us today. Uh, Claire is an associate professor of computer science and the head of the climate informatics group at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, which is one of the global centers for researching climate change. Um, she co-founded the Colorado AI Research for the Environment group, and she's working on data-driven approaches to um, detect extreme climate and extreme weather events, among other things. Um, so Claire, um, could you tell a bit more about how you do that, um, detecting these um, climate events and how this work can contribute to um, ecological sustainability and protecting our ecosystem? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so in our lab, um, we work on climate informatics, where we're guided by the vision that AI can shed light on climate change. And so you mentioned some examples with extreme events. We've shown um, that AI can use um, past storm track data to forecast you know, hurricane tracks at six to 24 hour leads. We've shown um, using satellite remote sensing to detect um, avalanche deposits in, from snow images that are hard for even a human to label. Um, but more broadly, we've been um, really a, a proponent of um, using AI for the study of climate change. So we um, presented at um, NERIPS 2014 um, a tutorial on um, climate change challenges for machine learning. And I think, um, you know, one example of the uptake take is um, Lynn's group. And another example that we're really proud of is in um, 2018, at Davos, the World Economic Forum um, published um, a report called AI for Earth, um, really um, laying out the groundwork um, to use AI for the study of the earth and climate change and outlined climate informatics as a key priority. Um, I would also want to mention that, um, so in addition to attending AGU and NERIPS and existing um, conferences, we've um, I would encourage those that are interested to attend you know, this conference that actually is at the intersection of AI and climate change um, that's turning one decade old. Um, and it's particularly timely to mention it now because the hackathon kicks off on the 22nd of September and it was supposed to be at Oxford, but it'll be virtual. And I think it's only 20 UK pounds um, to register and then um, we'll figure out you know, if people need financial aid, et cetera. Um, also, um, you know, extremes is just one area that we work on. Another area is trying to um, robustify. So right now, um, a lot of climate and weather predictions are made by physics-driven models. So there's a lot of first principles and science behind these models. But then when you have models from all different countries, you'll see that sometimes their predictions um, can really differ. Um, and so we've done some proof of concepts in the past that climate scientists found really interesting, where we could show that you could use AI to combine the predictions of an ensemble of climate models where the climate models themselves are physics driven. Um, and then with the benefit of historical data plus AI, we can robustify the predictions of an ensemble. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about any of those other issues. The other thing that we've found really helpful um, as a practice in building a new interdisciplinary field is the use of hackathons. So we've had, I believe, six um, years of the hackathon, and there's a different theme each year, like forecasting El Nino Southern Oscillation at a several month lead, which is a really hard problem, but you get a bunch of uh, students and young people together who know Python and have some basic machine learning together with people that know more about the meteorology and, and the climate aspects. Um, and you can see sort of the prediction error go down through different days of the conference. And the first day we kick off and then people can keep competing. Um, and so that'll be happening um, again this year. It's a different theme each year. Thank you very much also for, for mentioning your hackathon. Uh, this would be something for our Linz-based AI students. Um, you talked about the need um, 
for transdisciplinarity or bring together people from AI and um, the climate sciences. Um, Earlier today, I, I talked about um, the difficulties of transdisciplinary project in another panel here um, at Ars Electronica. So what are your experience, just um, quickly? Um, is it um, difficult to understand each other's language? You know, in my experience, sometimes terms are used completely differently in um, different domains. So what about um, computer scientists and climate scientists talking? <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, so, um, in in climate modeling, typically you would not use the word prediction for what we might in English say is a is a prediction coming out of a climate model. They would instead use the word projection. But this provided a lot of confusion because in machine learning, we're often dealing with high dimensional statistics, and a projection has to do with changing your your dimensionality. Um, so yeah, there have been a lot of funny examples. Um, and sadly, doing, due to the pandemic, kind of the only advice that I have from experience has to do with these in-person events. So um, you know, for many years, we held the workshop in Boulder, Colorado before last year going international. Um, and so there was always a hike. And this is you know, a, bo a bonding experience, especially one year when we all had to like climb around a rattlesnake. Um, you know, a reception where sponsors want to come and pay for beer, that also leads to very lively discussions over posters. And we were, you know, inspired by the communities that we came up in, in AGU or NURIPS for these sorts of social events. And so it'll be really interesting this year to see how we try to continue all that um, virtually. Mm -hmm. But the advice I would give to anyone that wants to do a collaboration is really, um, to build those relationships at the personal level. So if you are in Lintz and you're in any uh, economic or climate or um, you know, energy domain, to seek out a student who's in machine learning and vice versa if you're in machine learning. So especially in Europe, you can always find people working on climate change. And if you're an AI researcher, you really have um, a lot to offer. Um, and so those collaborations really have to start one on one with um, individual engagement. Yeah, and it's so important to bring bring the different skills and perspectives together for a positive future on this planet. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Next, I'd like to introduce a colleague from the Austrian Council on Robotics and AI. Uh, Mark Kirkelberg is with us, and he is not a computer scientist. Um, he's a professor of philosophy of media and technology at the University of Vienna, and his research is situated amid societal, technical, ethical, and environmental aspects also of AI. Um, he is a member of the European Commission's um, high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. This group um, authored the European Ethics Guidelines for Trustworthy AI, I think it was last year, um, in which Social and ecological well-being is defined as one of seven key factors of trustworthy AI. Um, Mark, given your background in philosophy, um, what are actually the, the issues that you absolutely want to bring into the discussion about AI and ecology and uh, that you might have brought to the high-level expert group as well? Okay, uh, good evening everyone. It's also evening here for me in, uh, in Vienna. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for, for your question. So um, I, I'm a philosopher of technology and I look at, at ethical problems with AI. So um, I see it a bit as my role here to, to be critical of, of everything that's said, but um, um, I also wish to express my enthusiasm for you know, using all this technology for the sake of of dealing with climate change, and I think there, there are great things going on, and um, and I'm really happy to be on this panel with all kind of interdisciplinary uh, people. So what what I could say is that from from the side of philosophy, ethics, um, yeah, th there are a few problems with using AI for climate. Um, one is that that AI can also be be bad for climate due to the the consumption of energy by 
um, by data centers, by computational processes. Um, so this is definitely something that, that needs to be de dealt with. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I know that you know, uh, many uh, companies and organizations are doing research about this. Um, so I, I think there can be uh, technical solutions to minimize this. Um, what, what is more um, something that, that I'm worried about is, is different ethical problems like um, transparency of uh, the technology. If we can really um, also as outsiders um, not having developed this technology, if we can see what this technology is doing and uh, if we understand what's going on. Um, something that, that um, you know, many people mentioned, monitoring by, um, by artificial intelligence of, of all kinds of things happening in the environment. I think something that, that, that is also a possibility is to use AI for behavioral change. Because one thing that has to happen um, is definitely not only um, you know, scientific work, but also just people changing their lifestyle, people changing uh, how they how they live their lives, and and this is uh, something that AI could help with. Um, and Martina, you're of course specialized in psychology, and you know you can do all kind of things to influence people and manipulate people. And uh, this always has ethical aspects. So um, uh, one one problem could be uh, in terms of freedom that if you really um, you know uh, manipulate people like that, whether you really respect the the, the rights of people. Um, uh, I mean, just to give an extreme example, like one scenario is that you have like um, AI take over the planet and, and steer the behavior of everyone. And that's very effective for dealing with climate change. Um, but obviously, it's a huge ethical and political problem to, to do so. And this is an extreme example, but they're definitely, I'm, as a philosopher, interested in this kind of tensions between different values um, uh, we, we have. Um, also, um, the keynote speaker has mentioned other species, um, and I think there there are also value conflicts because um, it could be that um, we have to make decisions who to um, you know to advantage by means of the technology. If we say that, um, like many people say, we need human-centered AI, that's fine, but it will also impact uh, non-humans, it will impact animals, other living beings. Um, so what about their interests, their needs, um, and, and the implications of our technologies for them? Um, this is some, something to think about. And then uh, finally, I would like to, to touch briefly a theme. Um, it's called Anthropocene, the idea that uh, we humans now have this enormous influence on the planet. Um, often bad influence, um, but of course we could we could also try to do good things. The the problem is that if we um, if AI is so, such a powerful tool, um, we can change a lot of things, but our grip on the earth only only becomes uh, more firm. So we we become actually kind of hyper agents, um, uh, kind of managers of the planet. Um, and uh, this is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, so we, 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 we should think about whether this is the kind of attitude we want to have to, towards um, uh, non-human nature and to, to, towards our environment. Um, so it's something to, to think about. Um, do, do we really, um, on the one hand, it seems all right to say like, yeah, we, we are stewards of the planet. We have to take care of the planet. But it's also this very attitude of trying to control things um, that has done a lot of bad stuff. Uh, that has has also led to to um, um, to some factors that that have contributed to climate change because we are um, uh, doing all these economic activities. Um, so these are just a num number of problems that I'm I'm looking at, um, and I think it's definitely um, important to not just keep that kind of concerns to the philosopher's room or to the um, to the cafe where philosophers discuss. Um, but it's important to 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 um, see what technical people think about these things, how they can help to solve solve some of these things like the energy problems, but also um, if there may be you know some some limits to the use of artificial intelligence or some ways we can direct the use of artificial intelligence uh, towards more ethical uses that, that will be great. 
and it's probably necessary to you know, to avoid the, some of the things that I've been talking about. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, was it difficult to um, to push forward um, ecological well-being or um, the aspects that you just mentioned in the high-level expert group? Um, well, it's, um, it wasn't uh, a priority or a team that was very prominent. And um, although it was mentioned, it, uh, there was very little interest in, in, in this, um, even not from people who, who defend interests of citizens or so, because usually they, they focus on things like privacy uh, protection. So um, what I did is that at the end, um, we so last year it's true that we produced this ethics uh, document, but um, this year at the end we, we, we produced a, an assessment list that can be used by organizations to assess their um, artificial intelligence technology uh, on various aspects, including ethical ones. And um, I worked on the, on the category of um, environmental and societal um, uh, consequences of AI um, and, and ask some concrete questions about like have, have you thought about the energy consumption um, you're creating um, have you thought about wider wider societal issues so I think that that's kind of um, very important to, to have um, a more operationalized uh, way of assessing this uh, so instead of just having the principle like okay AI has to be good for climate uh, to make very um, very concrete in policy also uh, in which direction we should go and and, um, and think like you know can we ask of people who develop the technology of companies who push the technology to to um, assess their own um, technologies not only uh, on the effectiveness of you know towards the goals that they develop but but also to to um, towards um, a more unintended effects and um, and yeah effects on climate and environment is definitely something that that's often unattended sorry unintended and uh, it is something that, that I think we need to to look at and and from a policy level see how how to regulate that how to stimulate also um, more research in that direction. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I think the AI assessment list um, is already on the European Union's website. Um, yes. Right. To, uh, can be downloaded by everyone. Uh, one person who is certainly very much aware of uh, the results of the European High Level Expert Group on AI is also um, Stefano Nativi, who is um, with us as well. Stefano is um, the big data chief scientist of the Joint Research Center and contract agent of the European Commission. Um, he coordinates the um, Joint Research Centers and um, um, AI and big data community of practice. And among others, he coordinates uh, projects on Earth observation and uh, in one pr preparational talk, he told me also about um, Earth digital twins, uh, which are used for this, among other things. So Stefano, um, could you tell us a bit about uh, the, let's say, the most important projects by which the European Union promotes artificial intelligence research in the field of climate protection, sustainability, and how uh, the EU um, um, positions itself compared to other regions in the world. Um, maybe you can briefly tell us about the projects you are currently involved in. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind uh, in introduction and uh, uh, of course, good evening to to everybody, and uh, I would like to thank Carla for the very interesting uh, keynote speech. Yes, uh, indeed. I mean, uh, uh, the European Communion, European Union, has uh, uh, a strategy on uh, artificial intelligence and a uh, plan on artificial intelligence and this artificial intelligence high level working group of course uh, is one of the many action uh, 
and uh, these actions uh, are uh, taking care of different aspects dealing with artificial intelligence, in particular in order to push artificial intelligence in public, uh, ad administrations in order to make them front runners in the use of artificial intelligence. Then, of course, uh, as uh, it was beautifully explained, uh, uh, we are also very much uh, uh, concerned about providing guidelines uh, on ethics uh, uh, in order to have uh, an uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, use in full respect of the fundamental rights. This is uh, what is called the European uh, lifestyle, you know, in order to consider ethics, privacy, fairness, etc. And uh, finally, also another important aspect is about, you know, regulation. So if needed, also this plan will consider to change national and European regulation where appropriate, of course, in order to face these new challenges coming with artificial intelligence technology, in particular, uptake by the public sector, but also the private one. So in the framework of this strategy, European Union, so the member states and the European Commission uh, decided to develop uh, a monitoring uh, uh, instrument in order to understand what is the European uptake in terms of social, technological and economic uptake of artificial intelligence. So this instrument is called AI Watch and the Joint Research Center, my, you know, <laughs> my entity is in charge of this instrument. I'm part of this. Uh, and uh, as uh, I said, we are very much interested in, you know, monitoring what is going on at the European, but also at the international level in terms of development and uh, uptake. In particular, I am personally engaged in monitoring the standardization area, because when a process a mature, is, uh, sorry, a technology is mature enough, then we have to start thinking about, you know, providing open uh, uh, specifications so that you can push, you know, this area and so that you can also establish interoperability among the different sectors and the different areas, the different continents of the world. And so, uh, I mean, we are also monitoring this. And in particular, I would like to spend a few words on one activity dealing with the env environmental efficiency for artificial intelligence and other emergency, emerging technologies. This is uh, this focus group is run by ITUT, uh, uh, and they. Uh, I mean, here the the objective is to provide guidance to stakeholders on how to operate this technology in a more environmentally and efficient manner. So this is, uh, you know, I guess uh, a quite interesting area. Of course, uh, also IEEE, for instance, is taking care of ethical, uh, you know, guidelines and how to assess how ethic, uh, how much ethic is your artificial intelligence algorithm or process. So there are many different aspects uh, uh, again here and uh, the international standard organizations, uh, they are, uh, you know, complementing each other's uh, in their uh, activities. Then the European Commission has also a strategy, of course, an important plan in order to make uh, uh, Europe uh, as uh, uh, maybe, I mean, the first, uh, we hope, the first climate neutral continent. So, you know, climate change and, uh, and uh, environment preservation is going to be a key objective uh, in uh, the European strategy, the new commission strategy, of course, in a sustainable way, as, uh, as Carla explained to us. And uh, uh, the objective here is to include the sustainable development goals in the economic uh, uh, activities and, you know, mechanisms. So to, you know, consider these goals when we are planning our economic growth. And uh, 
hear uh, a key instrument. Um, I mean, uh, it was very well, you know, recognized that artificial intelligence, uh, along with, the, I mean, several others, uh, IT, information technology, uh, is a key instrument in order to achieve this uh, objective. And uh, and uh, there are several, uh, you know, programs that uh, are considering how to use artificial intelligence, big data, and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, scalable inf infrastructure such as uh, high performance computing in order to, you know, uh, to be a, a more sustainable economy. And uh, I just, uh, I would like just to mention one, uh, um, which is uh, the Green Deal uh, data space activity. What does it mean? That means that uh, if you want to feed uh, artificial intelligence models and algorithms, you need to collect data for training uh, these models and then, of course, in order to feed them and uh, generate projection or, uh, you know, forecast, depends on uh, which, uh, on which community you are coming from. Okay, but but definitely, I mean, data is a key element. So this is why it is called a green deal data space in order to collect, to curate and share data. And in this framework, there is one uh, activity, initiative project, which is called Destination Earth. You anticipated that. The Destination Earth aims at developing digital twins of our planet. What does it mean? Uh, it means that when you collect in a, in a regular and curated way data about Earth phenomena, and then you use this data in order to generate insights by using artificial intelligence, okay? then you can use uh, the knowledge coming out from these insights in order to provide an effect, a feedback on these, uh, you know, phenomena, such as Carla, you know, explained it, for instance. Yeah. So this is uh, in a very, you know, oversimplified way what a digital twin could be. And uh, you can use a digital twin in order to run simulation, in order to answer, uh, I mean, what if questions. And, uh, this is a big program that the European Commission is going to uh, fund in, um, by using a new instrument, which is called the uh, Digital Europe Program. So new funds in order to use artificial intelligence as well as other IT technologies for the Green Deal. I, I think I covered it much of what I wanted to <laughs> one, say. <laughs> one question remains for me. Um, how to persuade um, other countries, other regions in the world to um, follow this way as well? Do you have a plan? Well, I, I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very, a very good question. Uh, actually, I didn't answer to your question. I mean, where Europe uh, stays in terms of, uh, you know, uh, of the other uh, countries, of the other continents, uh, as, as far as uh, artificial intelligence. Well, I mean, uh, our uh, way, it is different from US uh, and from China, China, uh, Chinese uh, you know, way, because uh, why clearly, I mean, the US uh, is very strong uh, in uh, in particular with the private sector, of course, it is also with the public and you know, research sector, but it is particularly, you know, uh, particularly strong with the private sector, the big company that have been pushing and using and also, you know, develop some artificial intelligence technology and frameworks. China is very strong as far as the governmental, you know, uh, steering and driving, you know, push as far as uh, artificial intelligence well i mean europe uh, uh, is aiming to push this ethical and this uh, you know fairness uh, uh, perspective so we really are working in order to bring these aspects uh, on the table and you know discuss with the other continents and uh, the other countries then of course europe uh, is also very strong with, you know, the public research, the, the, you know, the, the you know, the, the activity in terms of publication, innovation, etc. But as far as, uh, you know, the, the 
the general uh, specific role that we would like to play in this particular action. So I hope for your success. Um, last but not least, I'm very happy to welcome Tiga Brain. She's an artist and an assistant professor of integrated digital media at New, New York uh, University. Her work is at the intersection of art, ecology and engineering and um, also has been widely discussed in the last years, including in the New York Times or The Guardian um, and also in the Arts Electronica community, of course. Um, she calls her methods eccentric engineering. And if I've got it right, she actually likes technical systems, maybe also AI models that don't work perfectly. Um, why is that? So Tiga, can you give us a quick insight into your artistic work? And um, since you are the only artist on this panel, I also have to ask you, why is it actually important that there are also artistic perspectives on the topic of um, AI and ecology? Great, yeah, thank you. Um, it's really great to be here and be on, in such amazing company. I've been fascinated by all your work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I am really interested in where systems break down or misbehave because I think that does a few things, right? It like reveals the logic and the expectations we have of these technologies in ways that are uh, become very clear, right? So um, often I, I mean, I, I have a background in water engineering, so often I use the example of like a leaking water system. We count that as a failure, but it is actually a redistribution of resources to, you know, other organisms in a city or in a urban streetscape. So there's, you know, failures often can be approached from multiple perspectives and give us an insight of the way we build. So, you know, we're, we're designing te te uh, technologies to sort of, um, monopolize resources in that particular case, right? And so sharing these resources is seen as a failure. In the context of um, AI and machine learning, I have done a series of projects that are sort of addressing the limitations or the blind spots within these systems over the last few years. Um, I'm particularly interested in how like machine learning takes us from data to model to then agency in the world. So it is this tool for decision-making and I think that's something that really needs to be scrutinized um, um, for a lot of reasons, because you know it, 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 this is this is a very like political uh, thing. Um, but I thought I'd just share a couple of slides of some work of these projects, so you can kind of get a glimpse of of what I make, um, and then maybe we can continue the conversation. So I'm just going to click share screen. Uh, let's see, this one, share, and then if I go full screen, are you seeing a grey screen there? And now a wetland? Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I often work with wetlands and this is because, you know, I was doing this. Um, do you see my notes or you see the full image? We just saw the full, now, now it's the full image again. Full image, great, great. I'm sorry, I'm just getting used to this whole Zoom world we're living in. <laughs> um, so what you're seeing is a project called Deep Swamp. Uh, it's basically a series of these three sort of wetlands that I set up as an installation. Um, and each wetland is, the conditions in each wetland is set by uh, a very like simple, you know, machine learning uh, software that's able to take photos of its wetland and analyze the photo using a deep uh, learning process and then change the conditions within the wetland based on its analysis of the photo. Um, so, you, you know, the, the, thing, the, the project looks like this. Um, and each one of these wetlands uh, has been, each system has been exposed to a different data set of images. So it's trying to optimize for a different goal. One wetland has only seen photographs of wetlands in the wild. So images that I've scraped from Flickr of, you know, people's photography of wetlands. Another one of these systems has only seen images of, you know, landscape painting from the history of Western art. And then the third wetland has only seen images that actually have people in them. So images of crowds. And so as these systems change um, the conditions within them, trying to produce, you know, the goal, the, 
the what they understand the environment to be, um, you know, the the environments inside them sort of change and grow and respond to these to these different um, decisions that are being made in each of them. Um, so this work is, you know, it's it's looking at how uh, specific data is, how data is always coming out of a specific cultural context. Um, and how limited what we see through cameras and through sensors really, really is. Um, and so it also raises this question of, you know, what do we optimise environments for? Um, if we are going to step into this role of environmental engineer or planetary engineer, you know, how do we make the decision around optimization as a process? Who gets to decide what is considered best or most effective in this context? Um, Another work on similar issues is called an asunder. Is called asunder. It was a collaboration with Julian Oliver and Bank Sojourn, and it uh, puts forward this fictional geoengineering um, AI-driven system. The work takes satellite imagery, um, and using a GAN, it generates proposals for like um, dramatic geoengineering projects. So you can see the one here on the screen is the Silicon Valley. And it's uh, so has come up with a scenario of reforesting parts of the Silicon Valley um, and generating the satellite tile for this. The fictional satellite tile is then interpreted. And so here's one actually more from um, your part of the world. This is uh, coastland in the Netherlands. And you can see our, our system um, suggested that a whole series, a whole chain of islands be built out there in the ocean. And so again, this question of if we want to outsource agency and decision making to um, other intelligences, to intelligences that are born of data sets or um, systems like, you know, machine learning systems, then, you know, how does that sort of impact and how does that play into our human um, political systems, social systems and so forth? Um, so each fictional scenario is uh, analyze then for how the land use in it has changed. And then we actually try to model the fiction on in a real climate model. So the work also consists of this um, computer system and we use the community earth system model to sort of model this scenario. So it's also sort of putting these two different modeling techniques side by side, one machine learning and one driven, these physics driven models. Um, I think I should, probably wrap it up there. Is that good with time? Um, yeah, I'll stop my sharing my screen. Actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tiga, um, for showing some images of your work. I saw the work Asunder in the Museum of Applied Arts uh, in Vienna, I think. Right? Yeah. And uh, it's really great and uh, very interesting. So um, do you also see this um, as a task um, or a challenge for artists to raise awareness in a broader audience or to um, stimulate behavior change? Because I, I remember one of your earlier works, I think, which was this coin operated wetland, right? Where you, you had this laundromat installed next to some plants and people could uh, wash their clothes and it was uh, visualized um, directly on location um, how much plants are used to purify the water um, of one washing cycle, right? Yeah, so I mean, that project attempts to partner a wetland with a laundromat in a sort of mutualistic relationship. So what would it look like if we ran our infrastructures at the pace of natural systems, right? So instead of at sort of the pace of our economy, we look at the sort of natural intelligences or natural logics that we're surrounded with and we actually acknowledge or try to build our technologies in dialogue with these things. So rather than seeing technologies as sort of, um, you know, human centered or as, you know, purely servicing humans, what if we saw them as like negotiations with other species and with other systems and with other environments, then, you know, what does that open up in terms of how we would redesign or reconfigure them? Um, so yeah, I'm, I think that, you know, I, I talk about eccentric engineering because it's um, trying to look at technologies and engineering with different logics. 
um, trying to expand the scope of who these systems might serve that go beyond just, you know, the human. Um, if we are going to deal with tackle climate change and, and, you know, do the sort of carbon drawdown that we need to do, we need to also be considering um, a more than just human agenda here. Um, and I think, you know, I think the role of the arts in this context is to ask some of these questions and acknowledge these other agencies. And, you know, in art, art history, there's, long his there's a long history and conversation that's been going on about the other agencies that, ex that we live with and that exist in the world, but that we might not just be like attuned to. Um, so I'm also really interested in like machine learning and the the service of heightening a tent, right? Like I think apps like digital naturalism or like eBird, I'm so glad that came up too, about how it might help us like see our ecologies or develop sensitivities to them and therefore like, you know, change who we are as well and like what we care about. I think that's like really rich frontier for like art science collaborations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, one of you um, expressed fear before we started the panel that the 90 minutes would be too long. Um, definitely not. Uh, we don't have much more time. So um, we have to discuss discuss um, quickly, short questions, short answers, if that's possible. Um, anybody of you who would like to respond to one of the other panelists? Every yeah, Lynn. Is really yeah, I wanted to disappoint Mark a little bit if he like expects that it's going to be like a passionate fight of AI is good or bad for the climate or the environment. I think that that will happen because I think we're very much on the same page here. So um, like at least I and, and most people in, in climate change AI are really not um, arguing for the use of AI um, at all times or even for the sake of it. So only in, in, in places where it's useful, one should apply it and where the, where the risk and, and the downsides um, can be estimated and, and can be managed um, or don't exist. Um, that, that is like one thing that's really important to me. And, and I wanted to also say that, that um, it's really great that you pointed out the three ways that, that AI, AI can affect um, climate change. So it can be, can be used to address it in, in a way of mitigating it or, or um, adapting to the changing climate. Um, it can, but also be very detrimental by, for example, spurring consumption or um, helping oil exploration. And there are like numerous ways. And this is probably the, the area where we have to be most attentive and most careful and know the least about. Um, and then there is um, also the energy consumption of AI itself. Um, which can vary quite a bit, but depending on the model that you're looking at. Um, and also maybe like asking the question, is AI good or bad is not the right question to ask because it's already used and it's already used in industry and it will be used even more. So, so we really need to think about how can we make it consistent with decarbonization pathways. Yeah, totally. Mark, would you like to respond to that, right? Yes, yes, because my claim was not that, that AI is bad or something, um, or, or that the question should be, is it good or bad? I think it's just that I call attention for these unintended consequences. And um, I know that there's a lot of awareness among researchers nowadays. It's, I think it's, there's growing awareness that um, there are ethical aspects to, uh, to AI. Um, it's just that we live in a world where they're not only nice researchers working at universities, but also um, all kind of actors who have certain interest in pushing AI for, for purposes that can be not so good or that want it to do good. For example, companies that say, my AI you know, will do good, but it's, it's important to then look at what is actually the, the, what do they actually do? And is it really good for climate? Um, is it really going to help? Um, our policymakers may have the wrong expectations about AI uh, because they don't know technically what it is, but also because they um, they have watched science fiction movies and things like that. So I think it's a very complex kind of playground. And um, my intervention is to say, well, let's let's look together at these consequences. Um, and so it's not not um, an AI ethics uh, against researchers or against people be, be, that are busy with AI but rather just let, let together explore how to make things better and how to use um, technology for 
you know, to to to, to fight climate change. So uh, it's, it's definitely um, meant as a constructive kind of uh, point. Definitely, uh, Stefano raised his virtual hand. Yeah, thank you. No, I I was um, I will I am really interested in uh, the topic uh, raised by Lina about. Uh, green uh, ICT, you know, because of green AI, but more generally, we can talk about green uh, ICT. And this is definitely a, a, a one of the area where European Commission uh, has been discussing in the last, uh, in the last year, because uh, uh, um, as uh, I also mentioned, you know, artificial intelligence and the big data, we have two sides of the same coin. And so, uh, in particular, uh, if we want to limit uh, um, energy uh, energy consumption, we have to think to move this artificial intelligence as much as possible to the edge of the, of the network. So not to centralize and move a huge amount of data and then process centrally, but to try to you know distribute intelligence or so artificial intelligence. So, that, so this is one of the possible way in order to make uh, a greener, you know, artificial intelligence, but more generally, of course, IT. I'd like to ask you a favor. I think what is really important is to inspire hire, um, you know, young people to uh, maybe go in this area, may it uh, be computer scientists or climate scientists or philosophers or psychologists or artists and work together on a positive future. So um, each of you, do you have um, practical, you know, hands-on examples, how AI is used or could be used in, in the upcoming years to let's say to mitigate um, climate crisis, to reduce CO2 emissions, for example, um, that you think is inspiring and motivating um, for young people. Claire raised her hand. Um, so certainly in the field of renewable energy, uh, you know, solar um, and wind energy generation certainly works, but it's not usually integrated um, nicely into an electrical grid because there's really a lot of uncertainty um, about when it's going to be outputting energy. Um, and this makes this uncertainty and the lack of integration means that it's not very economical. And so, um, you know, it's harder for the consumer to directly purchase that kind of energy. Um, so machine learning is is good at forecasting tasks. You know, machine learning techniques are used to, to trade stock automatically on the stock market. And so if we can turn some of the attention of people that are interested in forecasting to real-time forecasting of the output of solar and uh, wind sources, then we can reduce the uncertainty that a grid operator has to assume when incorporating um, renewables. Um, and so that's one thing we started working on here in Boulder at, with the National Renewa uh, Renewable Energy Lab. Um, but I'm sure with all the renewable sources that there are in Europe, if you're a, an early career AI researcher, um, you can have an impact there. Uh, may, may I? Carla, please. Oh, hi. I, I was just going to follow up. You know, my experience is actually with computational sustainability. You know, clearly, you know, this is an opportunity for computer science who are interested in different problems. You know, the standard computer science problems are really focused. And, and you know, to be fair, and to be realistic, you know, a lot of our brain power has been devoted to optimize Facebook, optimize Google, optimize all kinds of, you know, uh, technological companies and very little, very little. We have put so little of our brain power into addressing, you know, really meaningful problems. So my, my, my view, my vision is exactly that, you know, AI, computer science, we could really transform the world. 
and we could actually use, and I'm sure Lynn and everybody here uh, agrees with me, we could use our, you know, uh, uh, the way AI is revolutionizing so many fields. I actually believe AI could really revolutionize the way we, we, we address these problems and play a key role in, in putting us forward towards a path for a sustainable development. And, you know, that is uh, uh, actually appealing to uh, young people. And I see, you know, segments of uh, 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 young uh, uh, researchers and uh, college uh, uh, and actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, students who typically are not attracted to the, 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 the <laughs> I'm not, I have to be, I'm a computer science, but to the, you know, narrowness of computer science, et cetera, where they are more interested in, you know, uh, uh, having an impact, uh, 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 a positive impact, are actually attracted now to AI and to this new field. I'm sure I see Claire saying nothing. So this is actually a, an opportunity for us to also recruit people who typically find, you know, computer science or AI very narrow. So I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, we can use, you know, AI to actually, and, and by addressing these problems, we can actually attract a, a young generation and use AR, you know, for a better world. <laughs> what about fighting overproduction, for example? I mean, I'm not an expert in this uh, particular area, but um, if you can predict, um, you know, um, what kinds of goods are needed when and where, um, is that a possibility or is that utopia? People Sorry. do that, yeah. I, I missed the, uh, but go ahead, Lynn, because yeah, I actually... I mean, exactly, the startups, for example, that try to optimize the, the food supply chain, um, try to reduce like food waste, which is an issue for the climate. Um, these are examples, like if you can, especially in like a cooling chain, if you can more closely match the demand with the supply, you don't have um, as many like, wasted goods, you don't need to cool them as long. Um, that would be like one example of, of the over cons like overproduction issue. Okay, um, Stefano, um, you raised your hand. We have exactly four more minutes. I just got the information that we have to stop right at uh, 10 p.m. So, um, yeah, I will be, I will be very, very quick here. I mean, uh, in my, in my view to be more sustainable means to be smart and smart means, uh, means that you need, uh, you know, cybernetic systems and artificial intelligence along with the current, uh, you know, connectivity, everything is connected today. So you can, you know, develop this cybernetic system by using artificial intelligence. And so you can, you know, avoid to waste energy, to waste food, to waste, etc., etc. This is, I think, the key point in my view. Mark, you wanted to add something. Yep. Um, just very quickly, um, I think one one Im important thing is to raise more awareness about the environmental and climate problems. And there, art and science can work together because the knowledge created by um, data scientists and other people working on the technology is not always understandable uh, for for others. And so it's a it's a it's a challenge there to kind of also communicate this knowledge in a way that then. You know, creates more awareness and in the end also changes um, how, how people go about things and decisions that are being made. Um, I think I have to conclude. Is there anything you have to say right now? <laughs> You want to add? Okay. I think each of you no, I is. I want to thank you for organizing this panel and my colleagues. This has been fun and uh, this, uh, these events are very important. Thank you. <laughs> thank you too for joining us. Um, and this event actually was organized by um, Alexis Kairos from Ars Electronica and by uh, Bernhard Walli from the Austrian Council on Robotics and AI. So thank you very much for all your um, preparations and the organization. Um, I think there's 
tons of material to read about your work on, on the internet. And uh, it was great to hear about your work. Uh, what I what is fascinating for me is that um, at this intersection of ecology and AI, it seems not difficult at all to find female speakers. Whatever this is, that's a great <laughs> side aspect for me. <laughs> um, okay. I want to um, thank you very, very much. Your work is incredibly important. I think uh, what this panel made clear is that there's a lot of work ahead of us, that transdisciplinary approaches are very, very needed, um, that you could um, make use of a lot of young supporters. Um, so. We need to inspire young people and inform them that artificial intelligence can be used uh, for for the well-being of us and of the planet. Um, I will start here at JKU in the winter term, which uh, will start um, in a few weeks um, in the bachelor program artificial intelligence. I'm teaching the course responsible AI. Hey. Hey, what happened to the light? Okay, it's 10 o'clock. I have to stop. And I will use the recording of this session as a teaching material. Um, yeah, we have reached the end of um, our time. It's completely dark now. I don't know why, but this is the sign. Um, the sun has sunk. I will go home to my little daughter who will hopefully benefit from the very important work of our great speakers. Um, thank you very much again. Remember, there is no planet B. Goodbye and good night from Ars Electronica 2020 from Linz. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.